Psychedelic Bible Study. I'm your host, Pem Das. And today's episode is the first episode, and I'm going to be talking about the story of Adam and Eve. My overall philosophy and the themes that I've discovered within the Bible is, is I feel that the Bible is essentially an instruction manual on how to control your slave populations by denying them God and instead giving them laws and rules. And God, of course, is the mushroom. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about some quotes here from the Bible. I'm going to make some commentary on it. I'm going to try to describe how um, the themes of slavery are inherent here and how slavery is something that is a form of conditioning. And that conditioning can be broken by natives and looking at the symbols in them, how the symbols repeat, how they create overall themes. I'm not interested in the dates of the Bible. I'm not interested in who wrote them originally. I'm interested in these as stories and how these stories have been used to influence people and their lives. And I think that there's secret teachings in here that we can uncover and we can have a new way of looking at them. So maybe we can understand the division between what some people think of as gods, which were really in every other religion, just the elite, the wealthy um, who ruled over their slave populations. So I want to talk about some of these stories in another way of looking at them. So I'm going to start right now by reading uh, from Genesis. In Genesis, the very first part of it is the creation of the earth. And so Genesis 1, uh, 27, or 26, actually, God says, uh, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So it's kind of interesting. I always thought that in this part, God becomes um, plural. He becomes group. Let us. It's basically a reference to maybe a class of people. Again, I'm breaking this down to a hierarchy that it, God is maybe the leader of all of these people. And they think oftentimes this has been referred to as the angels. That's what he means, supposedly. So in 27, God goes on to say, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in numbers. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give you every green plant for food. And so it was. This passage is often used for a lot of people to justify having like a million kids. I mean, oh yeah, it says in the Bible to be fruitful and multiply. But again, the more people you have, oftentimes that's the more taxpayers you create now in modern times. And back then it would have been, you would have had more slaves for your master, I suppose. But again, it, it's very odd that they always use that as a reference point to, to somehow make a lot of kids. Secondly, there's the, the lines below where he says about giving you every seed bearing plant. A lot of people use that to justify, you know, using the medicines, plants as medicines and not outlawing them. There's a lot of weird things in here that people try to justify and, and use for their lives. So that's one thing I wanted to point out. So that's kind of just the introduction. And then the more descriptive start we get down here, the story of Adam and Eve as, a, as an actual narrative comes in Genesis 2. So, and, and all that took place in the six days. So now uh, God made, we're going to get the description of, of Adam being, and that's a 2 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. This is interesting to me because uh, when I was younger, I used to study uh, mythology through Dungeons and Dragons, you know, the role-playing game. And there was a, 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 a monster called the golem. And the golem came from Jewish mythology, and it was a, a beast of clay that the rabbi would make. So, and essentially, that's really what you're talking about here is Adam and Eve actually, in fact, are kind of a mythological golems, which were formed to actually do a task or work for the rabbi. It's kind of fascinating. So, uh, he makes them from dust. Now, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. 
And the Lord God commanded him, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for if you eat of it, you will surely die. So here, this is another fascinating thing is that, you know, he put him in the Garden of Eden to work. And if you've ever worked in a garden, then you know it's a lot of hard work. And you can imagine, uh, you know, being told, oh, yeah, this is, this is paradise. Eden is, is the greatest place on earth. But you have to work it. You know, now supposedly everything came natural to people, but they didn't because he's working. And the only people that I know that work in paradise, like in America, were the slaves that were brought over here. They too were told, you know, they used the Bible to justify the, the founding of America as a kind of new Jerusalem. And then they used the, the Bible to justify slavery. And they brought people over here who had no context to the people who owned them and used them to do work. So it's, it's, it's a lot of, and then it's a lot of hard work. Now, I mean, I'm not comparing myself to a slave by any means, but when I was a kid, I used to have to come home and do chores. And we lived on a lot of property and it was like an acre and you had to like mow lawns, pull weeds, feed animals. Again, it's not like the hardest work in the world, but it's work. It's physical labor. It's not fun. So that's another concept is like you were, they were made to work in a garden and then they can do whatever they want, but they can't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil because it's going to, that'll make them die. Anyway, <clears throat> it's just a consideration here. The Lord, God, the Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So then he goes through like having all the animals try to be helpers for God and none of them work out, which is really kind of weird because ultimately he makes a woman after that that you have sex with and create children. So I, I read this and I'm thinking, fuck, man, was, it, was Adam having sex with all the animals trying to find a suitable one? I don't know. It's a really creepy idea. But at any rate, eventually, you know, God decides that he's going to make a woman for him. So, uh, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. The man and the wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So one of the things that's fascinating about this idea is Adam is a Hebrew word that means red and it's, he's from the clay. So you think of red clay, then you take the idea of um, Eve is created from a, one of his ribs. Now we think of a rib bone and they say bone, which is generally we think of as being white. So you have a white rib and a clump of red clay. Basically you have a mushroom. Eve basically represents the stalk of the mushroom. Adam is the cap. The cap emerges first, which is the creation of Adam, followed by the stalk. And this is also the whole idea of the man and the woman becoming one, the union of marriage. You basically have these two separate things that come together. You have the cap, which is the protector, and it protects the stalk. The woman represents the stalk, and she is supportive of the man. And it's I'm not trying to say this is what how we should you know, live, but that's kind of the interpretation here is that both the man and the woman come together as one, and that is what the, this symbolizes here. So that's kind of that story there, and I'll, and I'll get to that later too, because this is also calls to the fall of man, because you, if you think of this story as the story of a mushroom growing up out of the ground and then dying, and that's what it is, then uh, the fall of man is caused by a, by a serpent. Serpents, another word for serpent was worm, and worms were, um, they uh, were also the, the larvae of the gnats that would basically eat away at the stalk of the mushroom, which they'd eat away at Eve in a sense. The worms would, would eat at Eve and then the stalk would collapse and the mushroom would fall over. And that would be like a, you know, the fall of a building in a sense. So that's kind of like what this, so keep that in mind as I, as I go through this. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good and the food was pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, 
She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. Now, this is just a very simple story right there where the woman encounters the serpent. The serpent encourages her to eat the fruit because he's telling her God is not telling the truth. And in a sense, it is true. We don't, she doesn't die, but we never really have an, an understanding what God means by that. So we know it's not exactly poison. It doesn't kill you, but it does open your eyes. It gives you wisdom and it makes you godlike, but that's negative and bad. Because what that does is that breaks the conditioning and it means that you can no longer be a slave in their garden. The minute your eyes are opened and you understand, you don't understand like everything at once, but you realize that everything you've been told is kind of not what's the truth. So you start forming a new pattern and paradigm of maybe reality. And so that experience is just enough and to, to ruin their conditioning for you. And that's what the death is. The death is of a consciousness. And you realize at this point that Eden was never a paradise. It was a plantation. And all that was just changed from having this one experience by eating a uh, fruit from the knowledge of tree of good and evil, right? So uh, to continue, they, um, they, they covered themselves. Then man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman put you here with me. She she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So that's the thing that's interesting is no one has... This constantly goes on in the Bible where people never want to assume responsibility for their actions. They're always pointing at someone else, turning them into a scapegoat. You know, whether you take a a person, uh, like the actual scapegoat they use, where they assign the sins to a goat, send it off into the wild and sacrifice the other one, that's later. But this is the idea that you don't assume responsibility for your actions and you always put it on someone else. And invariably, it becomes the devil or the serpent. The devil made me do it, right? That's their reference. That's their excuse. However, God doesn't buy that one. He punishes them all. They're all punished. Um, Adam has to work the ground and toil in the stony and uh, thorny fields for food. Eve has to have pain of childbirth and be ruled by her husband while the serpent has to crawl on his belly and there's a curse put on him so that there's enmity between mankind and the serpent. And so that's kind of the basic, uh, the, the gist of the story here, I guess, is, um, you know, Eden is a plantation and Adam and Eve, basically, they, they discover consciousness that allows them to escape. Um, Eden could be a physical place. It could be a mental place. We can think of um, it's a state of mind, I suppose. And that freedom itself is, is a type of consciousness. And this consciousness can be um, discovered by eating um, a psychedelic plant, most likely mushrooms. So again, that's just to look at how the story of Adam and Eve could be seen as a, a psychedelic story and how that the tree of knowledge of good and evil is actually a mushroom. Furthermore, I might add that I do believe that the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is, the, in fact, the same tree as the tree of life. Um, to live forever is a really real uh, an idea that a lot of people have constantly, oh yeah, we're going to find a way to, to live forever and be immortal. Well, Immortality is a discovery. It's not that you are going to live in this physical body forever. It's a realization. You come to an understanding that, my God, you know, there is something in me that is um, going to continue to exist somehow in a type of consciousness after my physical body is gone. It is a realization. You can come to that understanding. I guess it's one thing for me to say it to you. It's another for you to actually kind of grasp and internalize that idea, which I think maybe psychedelic mushrooms can help you understand. Anyway, I hope you found this enjoyable. Please uh, help me out and give me some comments on there. And I'm trying to make this a little more interesting. It's very uh, weird to talk to yourself. A lot of these people seem to do this stuff without any um, problem. I have a lot of uh, weird, I guess, uh, insecurities that I don't enjoy listening to myself. So anyway, hope you do. Thanks. Thanks.